Welcome to Worship at St. John's. I'm so glad that you're here. You can connect with us at www.stjohnsumctc.org, also on our Facebook page and on YouTube. Couple of announcements for you. On Wednesdays, we are having a time of devotion and music at noon. It only, it's only about 15 minutes, but this peaceful, quiet time, if you are needing that, it's a great opportunity. And it's short enough that you can come on your lunch break. That is Wednesday at noon on, in the St. John's Sanctuary. Also, this is your last week to bring things for Susan's Market. We are stocking the shelves. You can bring things like toothpaste and paper towels or soups or even, this is so cool, a Jif to go chocolate silk. That sounds delicious. I might have to find me some of that. But any kind of items that will stock people's shelves, bring those on to the church and we will receive those and bring it to Susan's Market on your behalf. Welcome to worship. Let's turn our hearts, our minds, our souls, our strength, all that we are to praise the Lord our God.
And now we come to a time of offering and a time of prayer. Um, during this time of offering, I just want to speak to your generosity. Because of your generosity, we've been able to do ministry in the midst of ice and snow and, and power outages and water being turned off. Um, when we had planned Ash Wednesday to be both an at-home event and an opportunity here at the church for people to come and experience Ash Wednesday, what we planned for the church wasn't possible because the power was out here and the weather was so bad. And so what turned out to be an opportunity at home became our only opportunity for Ash Wednesday. And we heard back from you all that it was a blessing, that so many of you took that opportunity to do Ash Wednesday with your family um, and to begin your time of Lent with a time of worship and prayer and reflection. We made 100 bags, and they were bags for individuals, and 80 of them went into people's homes. We got an opportunity to send some of them over to Elmcroft, and so some of the people at Elmcroft got to experience Ash Wednesday, and then also we sent some of our Ash Wednesday bags um, to First Methodist in Lamarck. And there were people there who experienced Ash Wednesday. And so it is through your generosity, um, through, your, uh, through the ministries of this church, that we continue to minister in innovative and creative ways. And so thank you so much for your giving and the way that you have shared and cared for each other during this weather event. And now please join me in a word of prayer. Gracious and holy God, we are grateful for this time of worship. Lord, it's been another eventful week. We come to this time with our minds full of busyness and worry. We come to this time of worship already planning out what we need to do as soon as worship is over. We come to this time of worship and cannot quiet our minds and our hearts in order to be more aware of you. Oh, merciful God, remind us that you are as close as our breath as we breathe you in and breathe you out. Calm our hearts and take away our anxiousness. Help us set aside our need to be doing so that we might be fully present to you with all of our heart, our mind, and our soul. As we breathe you in and breathe you out, help us rest in your loving presence for a little while. Merciful God, we are so grateful for your love. We are trusting in that love. As we confess to you that we have often failed to follow your ways of love in what we have said and what we have done this week. Oh God, even as we recognize that we have done wrong, we look around for someone else to blame. We try to justify our actions based on influences that are outside of ourselves. God of justice and mercy, give us courage to accept responsibility for our hurtful words and our harmful actions. Help us to trust you completely as we confess our sins and receive your forgiveness. Show us how to make amends to those we have injured. Restore our relationship with you and our relationship with our family and our friends and our neighbors. Teach us again how to love like you and to follow the ways of Christ in our world. God of hope and healing, we bring to you the pain and the struggle of last week. Send help to those who are still suffering from the effects of last week's weather. Continue to be with those who are struggling from the effects of the pandemic. 
Pour out your comfort and peace on those who are grieving. Put your healing hand upon those who are ill, sick in body, mind, or spirit. Grant hope to those who are in despair. And open our eyes and our hearts to our opportunities to share your love and grace through acts of kindness and compassion. Move us to act as your ambassadors of love to friends, to family, and to strangers, that we might do all of that in your son's name. For God, you are a generous God, and you have been so gracious and generous with us. Help us to be generous with others. We are grateful for the many ways that you have blessed us, and we ask you now to bless these, our tithes and offerings, given today and given throughout the week, that they might flow through the ministries of this church and the larger United Methodist Church. So there will be a day soon when all might come to know the love and grace of Jesus Christ. For all that we have asked in this time, we have every trust and confidence in you that you have heard our prayers and are already at work as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Mark. Starting in chapter 14, we're going to look at part of the first verse, and then we're going to move through verse 10 through 11. May the word of God fall afresh on your ears this day. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. When they heard it, they were greatly pleased and promised to give him money. So he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we talked last week, this season is hard. It's a season that we look at ourselves. We look at the stories of Jesus, his last days here on earth, and it's a painful experience. Here we see a glimpse of what is to unfold. We see Judas Iscariot find the one group of people (laughs) that's ready to kill Jesus. And they're the religious authorities. You would think these individuals (laughs) would know God when they see God, but they don't. And we have this one individual that you would say, he has Jesus, and he's been walking with Jesus for three years but he doesn't have Jesus. Why does he do it? What is Judas Iscariot's motive? Mark doesn't tell us. Mark doesn't tell us why. We look for a motive, but we don't get one from Mark. The passage that we did not read together, there is this episode of Jesus in a quiet house with Simon, a former leper, and a woman who has this expensive jar of oil 
that she anoints Jesus with. And it is after this episode that Judas walks out and makes a deal with the priests. Motive is important to us. We like to know why. We like to know why people do what they do. When we watch a Criminal Minds series, it fascinates us as the story unfolds. And we understand the background of what's going on in the killer's mind. But in real life, when tragedy, tragic things happen, most of the time, we can't find a motive. A lot of times, that, that part of the story is hidden from us, and we search it out and search it out. And though we are so very curious about other people's motives, a lot of times we're not honest about our own. Why do we do some of the things that we do? During this season, one of the painful things that we get to do is look inside ourselves and be honest with our own sins, our own human fallen nature. That part of us that will choose selfish things to do. That part of us that refuses to do what we should be doing. For example, here recently, I've ha been so full of anxiety, I just want to hide away from the world. I have a plate full of things, and instead of doing those things that need to be done around my house and for the church, I've been escaping, escaping into Netflix, escaping into games on my tablet, and when somebody asks, have you got this done? I'm not honest and say, it's mismanagement of time. I say, oh, I just didn't have time to do it. But does the motive really matter? When my choices are skewed, does the motive really matter? Does it change really what happened? For Judas, whatever his motive is, whatever his brokenness is, whatever broke the straw of the camel's back for him that day, did it really matter and change the outcome, his decisions of that day? No. He still betrayed Jesus that day. That day he chose a path that was destructive for someone who loved him and destructive for himself. And his motive really doesn't change anything at all. It doesn't make us feel better about what happened what it does do, when we're looking at motive, it gives us excuses or reasons. A lot of times we want to hide our own motives. We've been doing this since the very beginning of time. You look at the Garden of Eden, and you look at the story of Adam and Eve, that fateful day when they decided to eat from the tree, God said, don't eat from this tree the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You can have anything else, everything else but that. But for some reason, they find themselves in front of that tree, both of them together. They ate of that tree, and motive really didn't matter. Because when God finds them, in the quiet of the day, they are both hiding from God, not willing to confess what they've done. And when God asks them point blank, what did you do? They said, well, 
Eve says, this snake, he told me, he told me. It wasn't her part. She didn't say it was my decision. She said, this snake told me. And Adam piped up. He said, well, because of this woman you gave me, it wasn't about their own reasons. It wasn't about their own actions. At that point, they were trying to save themselves. And motive really didn't matter. It was all these reasons to take the blame away from themselves. We do that because when we do something wrong, it hurts. We have to admit that we hurt ourselves. We may have hurt someone else. And something within us breaks. And to admit that is so very painful, so we try to cover it up in very subtle ways. Just like saying, instead of saying, I mismanaged my time, I can say, I didn't have enough time. So very subtle to protect my own self from blame. But the problem with that is When we do things like that and cover it up, we can't expect to change what's going on within us. When we, the desire to save ourselves is innate in us. Think about being a small small child. If you can remember yourself as a small child, getting in trouble from a teacher, from your parents, from the person that took care of you when your parents were at work and you did something you weren't supposed to do. And the question was, did you do this? And somehow it comes so easy to us and say, no. (laughs) No, I didn't do that. Somebody else must have done that. I didn't take that cookie. I didn't break that plate. I don't know how that happened. My dog ate my homework. It's an eight to want to save ourselves. But the thing is, we can't. There is only one person that can save us. And every time we try to justify our actions, we reject the one that can save us who took upon all our sin, that saves all of us, that justifies all of us, that gives us his righteousness so that we may stand before God righteous. Every time we make our own excuses and are not honest with why we do what we do, We reject Christ's offering of himself to make us right. The work of Jesus, a lot of times it won't help our situation. (laughs) Life is going to be hard. But the thing about Jesus' work on the cross is it changes something within ourselves. And motives don't matter. Our reasons and excuses don't matter. It's just the honest truth of I need Christ's work in my life because I cannot save myself. I can no longer sweep it under the rug. I can no longer project myself as perfect. I cannot no longer hide from people's judgment, hoping that I don't get caught for making selfish decisions, as small or as big as they might be. Only Christ can save me from myself. And only Christ can save you from yourself.
So your homework this week is to look at your own life. Look at your own inner turmoil. The silly thing about it is, is God already knows. God already knows. And it's just a matter of turning to God and saying, I need help with me, with myself, with my messiness. What is it within you that is just so messy right now that you need to just pass on to God and say, I, I did this, and accept God's work in your life through Christ's passion for you on the cross. May we return to the cross over and over and over again to find that justification, to find that salvation, to find that love and compassion and that healing. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning, St. John's family. This is Jesus Keep Me Near the Cross. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There's a precious fountain free to all a healing stream flows from Calvary's mountain in the cross in the cross be my glory my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river. Near the cross, my trembling soul, love and mercy found me. There a bright and morning star sheds its beams around me. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river. Near the cross, O Lamb of God, brings its scenes forth for me. Help me walk from day to day with its shadow over me. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever till my death should soul shall find rest beyond the river. Near the cross I'll watch and wait, hoping, trusting ever, till I reach the golden strand just beyond the river. In the cross, 
Jesus in the cross, be my glory ever, till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the As we come to the close of this service, you heard Cindy talk about Ash Wednesday. This year's been so weird, and I know we all long for normalcy, but right now it's still not quite normal. And so I'm going to offer to you, we have 20 of these take-home bags for Ash Wednesday left. We had 80 picked up, which I am so excited that people experienced Ash Wednesday at their house. That's so awesome. If you still want to have that experience, even though it's not Ash Wednesday, I want to encourage you, it is not too late. These bags are here. They are so powerful. The stories that we received um, on these experiences were so very powerful. So I highly encourage you, if you missed out on that, you really didn't you can still come and experience that and take that home. For each one of you, may the love of Christ rest in your heart, giving you a sense of peace and a sense of encouragement and a work of healing within your own soul. As we continue to travel with Jesus to the cross and beyond, may Christ's work be heavy upon you in your own life as we bring the kingdom of God out into the world. Amen. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. How's that? That's good. Uh, get this. Once I learn how to use this thing properly, you know, I'll, I'll play a big band or something, a little splanky, or take the A train. Oh yeah. Yeah. That was